Hey guys, good evening to you. We made it to the end of the week. And we, and we will probably finish the story. Chapter 20, Three Letters. A delivery boy cycled through the city streets with a lumpy sack full of letters. On top of the pile sat three very special letters indeed. The first one was for Arthur Slugworth, and when the boy screeched to a halt outside the gallery's gourmet, he rushed immediately to Slugworth's office and handed it to Miss Bonbon. Her eyes practically popped out of their sockets when she saw the stamp on it, and she ran as fast as she could, bursting through Slugworth's door. Miss Bonbon, he cried, don't you know how to knock? He was lying face down on a massage chair with, as a masseuse pummeled his back. Miss Bonbon held the lair below his face. It was stamped with a gold and enticingly swirly W. He leaped up and tore open the letter angrily, his eyes darting back and forth as he devoured the letter with furious speed. Dear Mr. Slugworth, last night you offered me a deal that I have decided to decline. I am, however, prepared to offer you a new deal. I will work for you and you alone. With your nose for business in my town, we could bankrupt the other two members of your so-called cartel and split the profits two ways instead of three. Farther up the street, the delivery boy was already at his next door drop-off stop, the tailors. He plucked the letter from the pile, folded the edges over, shaving it into a paper airplane. Then, with impressive precision, he lobbed it through... Farther up the street, the delivery boy was already at his next dropout stop. The tail is, he plucked the letters in the pile, folded the edges over, shaping it into a paper airplane. Then, with impressive precision, he lobbed it through the window of the tailors. It hit Fickle Gruber square on the nose. I'm being fitted for a suit, you peasant, Fickle Gruber cried out to the boy. He made to throw away the letter, but something caught his eye, a glinting gold W. The message inside, though he didn't know it was identical to the one Slugworth had received. I will work for you, and you alone. The final letter was for Prodnose, but when the delivery boy arrived at his residence, there was no answer at the door. He paused, looking for an open window to throw it into. But when he realized there wasn't one, he squashed the letter into a ball and gave it a big kick so it sailed up to the roof and straight down the chimney. It fell perfectly landed in the fireplace in the top floor bathroom where Prinos happened to be luxuriating in an afternoon bubble bath. He reached out a soapy hand and grabbed the letter. I will work for you and you alone. Well, I like the sound of that, Prado said. If you wish to discuss turn, go to Heim Heimlich's newsstand, E15. But this is where the letters were different. Although Prado was instructed to go to the newsstand, Fickleger was told to head to the shoe shine stall and Slugger to the old school. All at once, Prado leaped from his bath. Fickleger pushed away his tailor, and Slugger called for his butler. Tell Donovan to bring the car. In the zoo security hut, the guard lay asleep and had just consumed another party truck. Unbelievable, advocate says. He stood over the unconscious man. Isn't it, Willie News? He, he grabbed the keys to the truck, and the two of them hurried into the zoo and found Abigail. It's a draft, Willie, advocate cried. We're collecting that draft. More than Abigail, Willie said. How do you like to earn a few more Acadia mint? He gestured at the tick rickety zoo van parked by the entrance. It will involve a little jaunt outside your enclosure, but I assure you it is quite safe. Nothing more than a mere caper. Across town, Lottie sneaked into the telephone exchange and waited. Meanwhile, Noodles had donned a shawl and was running after the priest. She hurried up to him and tugged at his coat. Could you spare a piece of chocolate for a starving orphan, could you? She rests as she served. Slipped something into his pocket. I'm sorry, my child. I don't have any chocolate on me, the priest said. 
Never mind, you'll cry in much of the previous time as the strange girl skipped off down the street as if something wonderful had just happened. He didn't know what to make of this unusual scene, but that's because he hadn't looked in his pocket. Chapter 21 Uncovering the Code Prognos arrived promptly at the newsstand, his eyes greedily scanning the crowd for Willie. He was so engrossed in his search, and he didn't notice the clown lumbering up behind him with a large horn. Here we go, Larry whispered nervously. He honked the horn as loudly as he could, but the nerves got the better of him. And rather than a honk or two, he just kept going honk, 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 honk. Prognos swung around, and as he did so, Larry gave another big honk, and it produced a blast of air so strong it knocked Prognos' wig clean up. Oi, Prognos cried, what do you think you're doing? He bent down to pick up his hair, but Larry got there first and shot up with it around the corner. Come back here with my cat. I mean hair, Prino screamed, and he shot up after him. Larry stopped and thumbed the wig, his hands shaking. Inside, just as William said, he found the numbers they needed. 642, which is you which is also the start of a phone number in Lebanon. He memorized them and then turned back to Prino's. Hey pal, Larry said, get a le get a leash on that thing. Prino tried to snatch the wig back, but Larry held on to it and whispered. Willy Wonka says to meet him at the old copper mine, then he melted into the crowd. Not far away, Fickle Gruber arrived at the shoe signs stall and looked around expectantly, his nose wrinkled in disgust at the sight of the grubby people on their knees, shining shoes. Piper looked up and flashed it a smile. Shoe shine, mister? Fickle Gruber nodded and sat on the steps, his eyes on the crowd as he looked for Willie. You haven't seen a man dressed in a plump tailcoat, have you? he asked Piper. No, sir, she said, lifting his shoe and making a note of the numbers on the sole, 273. Then she dropped the polish, rose to her feet, and whispered, Willy Wonka says to meet him at the old copper mine, and before Fickle Room could say anything, she darted off. Finally, Slugworth was at the school as instructed. He stood inside, still and steely, like a, the statue of a great god. Larry approached immediately, confident from his last encounter with a chocolatier, and grabbed his hand. Is that the incredibly famous Mr. Slugworth? I want one of those bone-crusted business handshakes everyone talks about. Larry chuckled as his eyes searched Slugworth's wrist for the watch. Get off, Slugworth shouted, snatching his hand back. Larry began to sweat. There was no watch. Something the matter, Slugworth said. Uh, no, Larry said. I just wondered if I could shake your other hand. He grabbed Slugworth's other hand. There was no watch there either. Get lost, Slugworth shouted, pushing Larry away. Willie Wonka says to meet him at the old copper mine, Larry shouted in, in a panic as he scuttled off. He stumbled outside and bumped into Piper. Get it, Piper asked, hopefully. No, Larry pants. Hey, what do you mean, no, Piper cried. Larry clashed in a worried heap. He wasn't wearing a watch. Piper spies Slugworth storming out of the school, tugging a watch into his pocket. He's got it on a chain. He has a pocket watch today, she cried. Look! Larry slapped a hand to his forehead. Just my luck. What are we going to do? Without a check, without a second thought, Piper charged off toward the chocolatier and ran straight into him. He slipped and skidded and spread his arms to steady himself. What are you doing, you damn fool? He bellowed, shoving her out of the way. He took one last look at the crowd and accepting and accepting Willie wasn't there, climbed back into his car and sped off. Well, Larry whispered as he sneaked over, did you get it? Piper held up the pocket watch and smiled smugly. She noted the time, 8.16. Chapter 22, Abigail is on the loose. The priest stepped outside the cathedral and froze. There, then he rubbed his eyes in disbelief, standing in the middle of the street and eyeing him with a great hunger was a draft. Unfortunately, rubbing his eyes meant he momentarily broke eye contact and then just emboldened Abigail to move closer. She raised her nose in the air and sniffed. There, there, steady, nice draft, the priest said nervously, starting to back up. While Abigail didn't like that, she began striking her hooks against the ground. The priest, was, the priest was sweating now, his entire body wobbling in fear. Even his face and cheeks were wobbling like a cream caramel. Save yourselves, he screamed as he fell back into the cathedral, slammed the door shut. He tore down the aisle, passed words words in quiet prayer, and in a few very confused months. Get up, quick, it's a, it's the, the neck one. He was so agitated he forgot the word draft. Then Abigail crashed through the doors and galloped down the aisle behind her. The congregation had spoiled into panic. Stuff was flying everywhere. Bad shoes, hats, and everyone was screaming at the sound of some thundering hooves rose up into the rafters. 
The priest stumbled up the steps and into the pulpit and grabbed the telephone that was hidden beneath the lectern. What I have done to deserve this, he whispered to himself and he punched in the number. You know what you've done, Julius. Sold your soul for 20 pieces of chocolate. Operator? Operator! Hello, Operator, came Lottie's voice. How may I direct your call? I need the zoo. It's, it's an emergency, the priest said. Putting you through now, Lottie said confidently. Stand by, caller. There was a click. And in the telephone box nearby, the phone rang. Larry cracked his knuckles in the pit of the receiver while Willie, Noodle, Abacus, and Piper stood around him, looking at each other nervously. Hello, Zoo, Larry lied. The rest of the group made animal noises. Quiet down, you animals, Larry said, trying not to laugh. You too, Octopus, he added, putting on an underwire voice. Have you lost a draft? The priest screamed. Oh, yeah, I think we did lose a draft, Larry said. Well, it's easy to do, isn't it? The others could hear the priest exasperated shouts down the phone. Yes, easy to lose. That's what I said. Larry said, his voice cracking with laughter. The priest shouts became high-pitched now. Okay, okay, Larry said. I'll send the team round to pick up the draft. You just sit tight. Back at the cathedral, the priest hung up the phone and breathed a sigh of relief. But it was short-lived. He felt a gust of warm breath on his neck. Short, slowly, he turned to see two huge, hungry eyes peering down at him. Abigail began sniffing, and the priest began to whimper. She sipped his face and his neck, her muzzled whiskers scratching at his throat and making him wince. Then suddenly she plunged her head down into his pocket. A crunching sound made the priest jolt in surprise. When he looked down, he couldn't believe his eyes. His pocket was full of knob bright grain knobbly sweets. By some awful miracle, his pockets had been filled with mints. Mints now being demolished by an overenthusiastic draft. He was thrown from side to side as Abigail tried to wriggle her nose farther down into his pocket. He strained and spun, pulling his arms free of his rope, which collapsed to the ground as he bolted over the pulpit to safety. Then suddenly a beep sounded outside and the zoo truck burst into the doors, weaving around the debris from the fleeing congregation and screeching to a stop in the middle of the cathedral. Abigail's Piper and Larry jumped out. Better if you leave now, Abigail said to the priest. It's safer. The priest didn't need to be told twice. He ran as fast as he could out of the cathedral doors and didn't look back. Willie sat huddled in the back of the van, covered in straw, that, that smell of wet draft. Noodle was next to him, sitting with her legs tucked up to her chin and breathing only from her mouth to avoid the smell. A nervous excitement bubbled in Willie's stomach at the thought of the plan coming together. Piper hauled the door open. Coast is clear, she said. Come on. Willie and Noodle burst from the straw and made for the confessional. Willie squeezed inside first, while Abacus took the priest's side. Piper handed Noodle the codes, and she squeezed in, too. There was barely enough room for the two of them. No one was saying anything as a catch to nervousness spread through the group. Abacus gave Willie a supportive nod, and then he pulled the lever. A whirring sound sounded, and the confessional booth began to shake and shift, and soon it was descended into the depths below. Here we go, Willie whispered as they sank down into darkness. Chapter 23, Flamingo Jam Ping as the ele elevator doors opened into the crypt. The security chief looked up with surprise to see not a guest but the box of chocolate wrapped with a ribbon and placed neatly on a stand. She stepped inside the elevator and plucked the accompanying card from the stand. Thank you for all your hard work. Please enjoy these chocolates from both Father Julius and the Chocolate Cartel. Oh, that's sweet, she said, unwrapping one of the chocolates and shoving it in her mouth. Almost immediately, she was dribbling and slurping and bouncing off the ceiling. Is she now crying, Noodle asked from her hiding place above the elevator. And finally, Willie said he flipped his hands, thud, partied out. Meanwhile, across town, Slugworth's limousine nosed its way slowly through a flock of flamingos blocking the word. Sorry about this, sir, Slugworth's driver said, but a prawn delivery van crashed and spilled everywhere, and you know how flamingos are. Well, hurry the lawn, Willard Slugworth said. Tick-tock, tick-tock. He reached for his pocket watch and jolted in shock, when his hand could find nothing but the pocket. The band of his forehead began bulging, its furious eyes moving back and forth as he sifted through his recent memory. That woman, he shouted, suddenly remembering his collision with Piper. He reached for his car phone and dug Father, everything all right there? He asked urgently. Oh, yes, Mr. Slug Mr. Slugward. All is well. The priest said, at least it is now. What do you mean it is now, Slugward? Oh, we had a draft in here earlier, the priest said. 
Slugger turned to see a flamingo aggressively pecking his window. Sorry, the line is bad. Oh, what? It sounded like you said draft. But that can't be right. Yes, uh, the priest interrupted. A draft from the zoo. We had to clear the whole place for about 20 minutes. But everything is back to normal now. Slugger hung up and dialed Bigger Gruber and Proud Nose on his special cartel phone. It was a direct line. To every member all at the same time. Gentlemen, Slugger said, where are you? On my way to see the tailor, Fickle Gruber lied. I am just having a bath, Proud Nose screeched. I am. The line fell silent before Slugger said faintly, In your car? It's a car bath, Proud Nose squeaked. Why haven't you got one? Slugger sat very still as he listened down the line, pecking on windows the same squats and flapping said, Hello, Fickle Gruber and Proud Nose said at once. I'm still here, Slugger said, and so are you. We're stuck in a flamingo jail. You're going to see Waka. We all are, except he's not going to be there. Why? Where is he? Fickle Gruber asked. In the crypt, Slugger said. A red wave's come consuming him, robbing us. Chapter 24 The Vault and the Truth William Newell stood by the gargantuan steel door to the vault. There were three individual coated dials, one mark for each chocolate tube. Newell held up the three pieces of paper from Piper. She read them out slowly and carefully so Willie wouldn't make a mistake. Six, four, two, she said. Two, seven, three, nine, one, eight. Willie dialed in the combination, took a deep breath, and then together they heaved the huge wheel dial trying to open it. One, two, Willie whispered. Three, the lock didn't budge. It's the wrong code, Newell cried. It didn't work. Willie slunk. They were inches away from the final piece of their plan, but without the code, they might as well have been all the way back at the start. Uh, Noodle said, make... Ah! Noodle said, making Willie jump. Hang on a minute. What is it, Noodle? He asked hopefully. And then he saw what she was doing. She was rotating the last piece of paper. It might have been upside down. She said, try eight one six. Clunk! Noodle, Willie cried, looking at her in eyes. She heaved. As he heaved the heavy door open to reveal a secret lair filled with pipes and valves and strange control and clay and machinery. Well done. You passed the, te the test. What test? Noodle asked. The upside down number test, Willie replied. That's not a test. It's ab it, it, it absolutely is a test. Now, he said, his eyes scanned the realm. Let's find that ledger. They raced into the lair, emptying drawers and upending piles of paper. They searched under chairs and under rugs. They searched everywhere. Anything, Willie asked. Noodle threw some chocolate boxes to the ground in frustration. Nothing. Well, keep looking, Willie said. It's here. It must be. Willie Noodle slumped in, into a chair. It's not here, Willie. It must be. Abacus told her. Abacus has been in the wash house for the past four years, Noodle said. Maybe they changed it. Maybe all that scrubbing went to his head. All that's down here is a load of stupid old chocolate. She picked up a box of Slugworth's chocolate and threw them hard. The chocolates went flying across the room. The box crashed into a tile on the wall and a strange click sounded. Then the tile did an incredible thing. It flipped over to reveal the hidden compartment behind it. Inside was a chunky book bound in green leather. The green ledger, Willie cheered, grabbing it and hoisting it in the air. You had me going there for a minute, Noodle, but you knew where it was all along. No, I didn't. I just... Suddenly there was a bang. Willie turned to see Slugworth's arm and blocking their only exit. Fickle Grewer and Pradno stood smugly by his side. Naughty, naughty, Mr. Wonka, Slugworth snarled. You've caused us quite a bit, bit of trouble, you and your urchin. She's not just an urchin, though, is she? Willie said, bravely stepping forward, e eager to not miss his chance to find some answers. Your family. What, Noodle? What, Noodle said? What are you talking about, Willie? You know that ring, he said gently, the one you got from your parents? Well, Mr. Slugworth has one just like that, don't you? Slugworth narrowed his eyes at Willie and knew, as Noodle pulled the ring from around her neck. That was my brother's ring, Slugworth said. His eyes still fit some Willie. Zebedee, he, he was called. Noodle stared on at the necklace and whispered, Was he my father? A pulpless romantic he, is what he was. Slugworth spat, fell in love with a common little bookworm, but died before they could marry, leaving me sole heir to the family fortune, or so I thought. Then I heard you were soon to be born, another heir with a claim to my money. But as luck would have it, not long after you arrived, your mother showed up on my doorstep, begged me to get a doctor for her sick little newborn. 
I said to leave the child with me. I could help. Willie moved closer to Nuno, worried for his friend. The news didn't seem to have sunk in. She remained emotionless. Her face blank and unreadable. Then the hand gripping her ring be began to shake. Of course, I had other plans, Sluggo said with a wicked grin. You didn't take me to a doctor, Nuno said. You took me to scrub it and bleach it. Down the laundry chute you went, Slugworth laughed, to a sad little light. Not end for Noodle, she said as she thumbed the ring. Z for Zebedee. It's the meanest story I've ever heard, Billy cried disbelief. And what lie did you tell her mother to cover your trip? Oh, I said the baby had died, Slugworth said dismissively. I gave her a bag of sorrows and sent her back where she came from. She was heartbroken, but she believed me. Willie turns his attention to the beefy green ledger, flicking through as fast as he could go. Where did you send her back to, Slugworth? Nilo said her voice desperate. She might be out there still. What's her name? Oh, Slugworth said, tapping his chin. No, then. What was it? Uh, no, I don't think I can remember that. You must understand, she was very poor. Fickle grew her, wretched at the word. Sorry, Felix, Slugworth said. Willie stopped rifling through the pages of the ledger and looked up, his stomach flip-flopping. I found her, he said, Noodle. She was called Dorothy Smith. Willie, Noodle stared at Willie in disbelief. You found her. Look, Willie said to an entry in the ledger. She's right here. Noodle read the ledger, then suddenly her head snapped up. Wait, Willie, how did you read that? I guess you did teach me to read after all, he said with a smile. Well, this is all very touching, Slugworth said. But I've got a treat for you. Flicko Grover snatched the ledger from Willie. What treat, Noodle asked. Slugworth fixed her with a grim grin. Death by chocolate, he snarled. Chapter 25, Death by Chocolate The cartel marched Noodle and Willie through a steel door with a small porthole window at the far end of the lair. Inside, an enormous tank filled with chocolate bubbled before them, looking like a great, big, and very deadly medicine bowl, wherein blades sliced angrily through the mixture. Fickle Grewer pulled the lever, and to Willie's relief, the blade stopped. But his relief was short-lived. On you go, Slugworth said, nudging the pair onto the top of the blade that stretched out before them. He gestured along the blade all the way to the middle of the tank, where a small metal island sat, the steel plate that held the blades in place. Considering the situation, Willie said, as they made their way to the center of the tank, I wonder if you gentlemen would do a good deed on my behalf. A what? Fickle Rupert said. A good deed, Pranos clarified from. It's a sort of pointless act of selflessness. Of course, Mr. Wonka, Slugger said quickly, clear and keen to move things along. What is it you want us to do? Willie reached into his hat and pulled out a jar of chocolate. I wonder if you could give this to someone, only if you happen to see any other suit. Willie tossed the chocolate back to the cartel. Who is it, Slugger? Uh, a little orange man about this high. Willie held his hand to his knee, and he has green hair. Uh, Slugworth said, I owe him a jar of chocolates, Willie said, and well, I think these might be the best they've ever made. He jiggled the jar inside where hovered had shaped chocolates. Only these ones were striped in vivid shades of purple, green, and blue. Right, sure, he, I'll see you gets them, Slugworth said dismissively. Now get walking. Willie and Noodle had no choice. They inched their way across the perilous blades of the little island. Fickle Grewer pulled the lair once blue, and the huge blade started up again, trapping them there. Willie and Noodle watched in horror as the chocolatiers then left the room, sealing the door behind them. Behind the porthole, the men stood at a wall of bells in the lair, turning them one by one. Immediately, chocolate came bursting from three pipes that lined the tank, spilling down like thundering waterfalls, one from each chocolatier's factory. The level rose fast, and soon the liquid was splashing against their, suit, their shoes. Willie gulped. In seconds, they were lifted up by the liquid, rising toward the roof of the tank, but the force of the blade was pulling them down deeper into the chocolate. They watched hopelessly as the chocolatiers re retreated farther back into the lair and could see Fickle Grew returning the ledger to the secret compartment. Willie, Newell shouted as the chocolatier reached their side, Start kicking, we have to stay afloat. She was right. If the blade dragged them under, they'd be turned to pieces. But the roof of the tank was inching closer, and once they finished the top, they surely drowned. But Willie had other concerns in his mind. He began pulling bottles of ingredients from his pocket and chucking them half-heartedly half into the mixture. 
What are you doing, Needle cried. If we're gonna die by chalk, die in chocolate, Needle, he said, that is going to be Wonka chocolate. Ping! The elevator arrived back in the cathedral and the cartel stepped out. Slugger looked at the jar of Wonka's chocolate. Yes, he's ever made, eh? And then he grabbed a handful and put them in his mouth. The others did the same. No, a gentleman, the priest said sheepishly as he appeared behind him. It was a bit of a close shave today. I'm just wondering if we should think of our arrangement where Slugworth threw the, threw the jar with the blast of the chocolate and the man's face lit up. We just leave things as they are, the priest said, looking at his lips. That Wonka might have been a nutty as a fruitcake, Slugworth said, that the cartel made for the door, but he sure knew how to make chocolate. You think we should have saved some of the small orange man with the green hair, Prano said? Tell me you're joking, Fickle Gruber said. Of course I am, Piranha's cried before asking, why am I joking? Because there's no such thing, you nick-em-poo slugger fellow. I know that, Piranha said indignantly, but then, why did he say there was? Back in the tank, Willie and Noodle's heads were bobbing perilously close to the ceiling of the tank. The chocolate was slushing into their mouths, and Willie knew it was only seconds before their entire heads would go under. Up above them, they saw a small round window. Help! 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 They screamed over and over again, desperately banging on the glass. Suddenly, shadows floated over them. People, Noodle said, splattering chocolate. It's the cathedral up there. They heard us. But then the shadows grew closer, and their faces became clear. Oh, not them, Willie cried, as Slugworth, Fickle Grimmer, and Prognos grinned down at the pair. Those smug smiles were the last thing Willie and Noodle saw before the chocolate flooded their faces and the world disappeared. Chapter 20 Cents Oompa Loompa in an Elevator the priest sat huddled in the confessional, polishing off the last of the chocolate, mutterly gunly to himself. You must pull together you must pull yourself together, he whispered. Honestly stop worrying about these very minor misdeeds. It's not like anyone is going to appear and punish you. It's just chocolate. Correction came a growl, and the priest looked down to where the noise came from, right next to his shoe. It's my chocolate, the Uncle Lover said. Imagine my surprise when I followed the smell and it led me to you eating my chocolate. The priest immediately fainted, and the empty jar dropped into the Oompa Loompa's arms. His face grew very serious indeed. You steal from an Oompa Loompa, we take back a thousand fully, Bell. Then he snuffed and, snuffed and sniffed the air. Chocolate, lots of it. He sniffed again underground, the perfect compensation. He spied the little lever next to the priest and pulled it down. Much to his surprise, the confessional box began to move. When the elevator door opened the crypt, the Oompa Loompa pulled a string by his side and a pair of mechanical wings unfurled from his jacket. He took off soaring through the vault, following his nose all the way to the chocolate tank. He hovered at the small porthole window and watched the churn chocolate, but then something shocking caught his eye, a familiar top hat swirling in the mixture. He gasped when he realized, and quick as a flash, he darted to the walls and valves and controls where he spied a lever marked emergency drain. He pulled it, and immediately the tank started glugging and bubbling, and much to the Oompa Loompa's delight, the blade stopped churning and the lever and the level began to fall. The Oompa Loompa binded his neck, wincing as he waited to see what would be left of Willie at the end of it. In spite of the chocolate slopped out of the tank, it was so quiet, so still, so lifeless down there. Then suddenly, Willie and Neela broke the surface, coughing and splaring and taking enormous gulps of air. We're alive, Neela cried with joy, giving Willie a hug before shaking some chocolate out of her ear. Willie could hardly believe it. He was so happy. He began doing somersaults, swirling around and around the vortex of chocolate as it drained from the tank. Soon it was almost empty, with only some chocolate pellets remaining at the bottom. We've been saved, Noodle said, splashing about happily in what little chocolate remained. Who saved us, Willie glanced. Willie glanced up and saw a small figure hovering by the window. Aha, he said, giving his friend a grateful nod. It was the little orange man with the green hair, Noodle. I'm serious, Willie, Noodle said. So am I, Willie said. He's right there. But when Noodle looked up, the Oompa Loompa was gone. Chapter 27 The Empty Jar The cartel emerged from the cathedral just as the chief lumbered around the corner, accompanied by affable and a couple of assistant officers. Eating 1,800 boxes of chocolate had really taken his toll. His face was gray and smeared with chocolate. His eyes were as heavy looking as a strike. He puffed to a halt and cried, Gentlemen, thank goodness you were right. I came as fast as I could. A robbery, you say? Don't worry, chief. Everything's under control. A couple of thieves broke in. But I'm afraid they met with a little accident, Slugworth said grimly, in which they died, Frognose clarified. The cartel laughed. What's the big joke, came a voice, and they all turned in forward to see Willie standing on the cathedral set for Newell, driven in chocolate and very much alive. Wonka, Slugworth fellow, you should be 
he stopped when he saw what was in Lewis's hand, and then he started to tremble. Officer Willie said, calling the officer affable. Would you kindly take a look at this? Nilo handed him the green ledger. It's details every single illegal payment these men have ever made, Nilo explained. Flashing the cartel is status by smile. Status thousands of them. Behind them, the priest civiled out of sight. Don't listen to her, Affable, the chief cried. She's lying. Well, of course she is, Slugger spat. Officer Affable opened the ledger and his eyes grew wide as he leaped through the pages. She's not, sir, he said. She's absolutely right. It's incredible. The sweat began to form out of the chief on the chief's brow. He went for a different approach. Oh, well, then it sounds like a case for the chief of police. Give it to me, Affable. I'll take it from here. But as the chief grabbed from the ledger, Officer Aswell held on tight. I can't let you have it, I'm afraid, sir. He said, and why is that? The chief asked he glanced nervously at Slugworth. Your name's in here too, chief. Officer Aswell said, a lot. The chief dropped to his knees. Curse my sweet toast, he squealed. It was, good as, it was as good as a confession as any. And with a nod from Officer Aswell, the other officer moved to arrest the cartel and the chief. All right, I'll confess. I'm weak. I'll flip the cartel wheel. The chief will. I'll name names. I mean, you know their names, but I'll name them anyway. All I ask is just a little bit of chocolate. Gentlemen, Slugworth said, sent him the game was up. Run! They shot out through the square, but before they could get far, something incredible happened. Their feet lifted off the ground and soared up into the sky. Oh, no, not again, Slugworth. Well, you didn't need any of those chocolates, did you, Mr. Slugworth? Willie called up to them as they rose higher and higher. Slugworth bared his teeth in fury. Why? With their hovercrafts, Willie said. My new delayed action burden, and that's your strong. At the speed you're going, I say the three of you ate a lot. Slugworth grabbed hold of a jet of frozen wire, sticking out of the fountain. Then Fickle Gruber grabbed Slugworth's shoe, and Prodnos grabbed Fickle Gruber's ankle. There, there they were. The formidable chocolate cartel, a neat living strain of criminal bunting in the sky. You think you're so clever, don't you? Slugworth shouted down to Willie. Where there's a billion stars of chocolate beneath our feet. We'll get the best lawyer. Bribe the judge. Rig the jury if we have to. We'll be fine. I wish I thought of that, Willie said. A hint of a smile breaking on his face. Noodle? Noodle gave a nod and clenched a wrench against the fire hydrant. It was the final part of the plan. The bit they had all been looking forward to. Deep below, huddled among the city's pipe work, the others heard her sing that. Now, Piper cried, and together she, Abacus, Lottie, and Larry began unscrewing bolts on the pipes. What are you doing, Wonka? Slugworth shouted down, his voice rapid and suspicious. Why does she claim that fire hydrant? You will just smile sweetly at him, and as the ground beneath their feet began to quake, tiles slipped from rooftops, the melons rolled off the fruit cart, and everyone in the square stopped and looked down. The icicles on the fountain's spouts began to creak and crack. Slugworth's hand slipped slightly as he tried to cling tighter onto his icicle. Then suddenly there came the sound of rushing wire and the fountain burst back to life. Only it wasn't wire. It's chocolate, Slugworth screamed. Prado's guests are chocolate. We're ruined, Fickle Gruber cried. Immediately the icicles Slugworth and Pullman snapped in two, and the chocolate tears floated up in the wave. Ruin, Willie called to them. I don't know. To me, it looks like you were going up in the world. By which he means we're physically going up. Prognos clarified, but finally, but financially, oh, shut up, Prognos, Slugworth said. You're an idiot, Slugworth, Fickle Gruber added. Well, at least I'm not sick every time someone mentions the poor, Prognos scuffed, and they began grabbing at each other, kicking and throwing punches as they drifted higher and higher into the sky. But only Willie was watching them. Everyone else was fixated on the chocolate. Some were licking the walls. Others were diving into the fountain. Don't worry, gentlemen, Willie called up to them. You'll come down eventually, I think. Until then, we need... To figure out what to do with this child, he dipped his finger in, into the fountain and gave it to. He showed now some now some say good childhoods would be simple, plain, uncomplicated. He began pulling bottles one out of his pocket and chucking them into the fountain. But well, I'd like a little complication, elaboration, innovation, and short wonkification. Suddenly, the chocolate in the fountain began to bubble and turn a glorious shade of purple. Ladies and gentlemen, Willie said grandly, "My friends and I invite you to enjoy our chocolate." The workers rushed to the side, and together they watched as the cartel grew smaller and smaller and discussed a squalid mass of men rising up and up before disappearing from sight. Chapter 28. Arrest Them Back at the warehouse, Mrs. Scrubber was organizing the bundles of money and the piles and labeling them. Nice old house in the country, she said, tapping one pile of massive barrel of warm wire, fancy new pack. 
but she was interrupted by Bleacher, who's, who burst in and bolted the door hastily behind her. It's the cartel. He hits. They've gone down. Mrs. Scrubber rose quickly to her feet. Well, we didn't do nothing except poison all those chocolates. There was a knock at the door. Police came a shout, followed by more knock. Quick, Mrs. Scrubber cried. Eat the evidence, police. Police! This the second officer, Mrs. Scrubber, said I'm on the toilet. They grabbed the tray of strange bottles they stole them from Willie and began gulping down what remained inside them. Almost done, officer, Mrs. Scrubber said. Oh, no, still more toilet in the go. Scrub it, bleacher, open up, or we will knock this door down. And they did knock, knock it down. But when the poor arrested officers burst in, they found not so much two criminals, but instead two massive mouths of hair with eyes. Mrs. Scrubber had long blue hair to her ankles and a massive blue beard, and Bleacher had green hair when he pulled back off his swollen face to reveal some yellow spotted skin. It took a while, but the officers eventually found their arms and put them in handcuffs. As he did so, Mrs. Scrubber struggled free and ooze. One last kiss, my lord, before we are forever parted. Oh, puppy, what Bleacher says is the kiss. One final slobbery, wormy kiss. Chapter 29, Dreams and Promises. Willie sat on the steps of the cathedral, watching the whole city enjoy the rich chocolate flowing from the fountain. He felt a warmth wrapping around him. It was a feeling he hadn't felt since he was a small boy on a small boat. He reached into his pocket and pulled out his old birthday bar of chocolate. Finally, it was time. He took a deep breath and peeled back the wrapper, but much of his surprise, there came a brilliant flash of gold. Willie's heart stood still. Slowly, he removed the rest of the wrapper and held the and held the gold paper up to the light. There was a faint message on a message that now, thanks to Newell, he could read. The secret is it's not the chocolate that matters; it's the people you share with. Love, Mama. Willie traced her words with his finger. Tears went on his cheek. He could feel eyes on him, like she was there. He looked up hopefully, and there she was, standing in the crowd, looking back at him. You kept your word, he whispered. You're here, Mama. She smiled proudly at him and then gestured at, at the chocolate in his hand. Willie raised it in the air with a lump in his throat. He knew it would be the very last chocolate person he would ever eat. And as the tear fell, he snapped up the corner and popped it in his mouth. His mother clasped her hands with joy, just as she'd done on every birthday. Every time they shared chocolate to go, he wanted to cry out. To grab hold of her and keep her forever. But he knew he couldn't. As the chocolate melted in his mouth, she began to fade. Softer and softer. Fainter and fainter. And then she was gone. But she would never truly be gone. Not really. He knew that now. Noodle came skipping toward him. Willie wiped his tears and broke up a piece of chocolate for her. As she chewed on it, a look of pure joy spread across her face. One by one, the rest of the warehouse workers joined them and handed them each a piece of chocolate. They ate the whole bar together, all of them like one big family. It was just as he dreamed. No, it was even better than that. This really is the best chocolate, Noodle said. Willie smiled at the empty wrapped in his hand. I wish it could last forever. The cathedral bells chimed. I guess it's time, Willie said. Time for what? Noodle asked. What's going on? The other workers began grinning and nudging each other excitedly. You know how many people called D. Smith live in this city, Noodle? Willie asked. One hundred cents, Abacus answered. We checked in the phone book. But luckily, Willie said, you have a friend who works at the telephone exchange, and she spent the whole afternoon running around, and guess what? We found her, Lottie squeaked. Noodle froze in shock. You found my mom? You found Dorothy Smith? None of us felt right going home until you had a home, too, Abacus said. Willie held out his arm. Come on, Noodle. I think you're going to like where we're going. Chapter 30. Z. The library, Noodle guessed. My mom was at the library and lives there, too, Willie said, in a house of imagination. It's, it's, isn't it wonderful? It's just like you dreamed. A beautiful old building full of books. The place was very grand, with windows that shone with welcome and light. And it was tall, too, and needed to be, because inside it housed more characters, cities, creatures, than even Willie had met on his travels. And though many thought of it as a quiet place, really, there was nowhere in the world more full of life and loudness. Noodle opened her mouth to speak, but no words came out. On the steps to the woman, stood a woman, waiting patiently, like she had been waiting there. She was tall like the library itself, and the sunbeams bounced off the snow beneath her feet, laying up her like an angel. Off you go now, Noodle. Off you go now, Willie said. He gently nudged her to, toward the steps. 
Willie climbed, Noodle climbed the stairs slowly at first, and faster and faster. Willie watched with joy as Noodle's mother pulled her into, into a hug that looked like it would never end. Noodle peeked out at Willie and mouthed, Thank you. He smiled and gathered his king. It was time to go. But just as he turned to leave, a voice made him stop dead in his trip. So goes a good deed in a weary world. Epilogue. Wonka. Noodle was so very happy in her new home in the library with a kind-hearted mother and, and a never-ending reading pile. Though it had only been months, she felt as if she'd been there her whole life. The horrible years of scrubbing and bleacher had already begun to fade, worn thin in her memory by every warm hug from her mother. Life had become had become predictable and ordinary and truly wonderful. Though her friend Willie had mysteriously disappeared, no one knew where he had gone and everyone missed his childhood. But one night after she slipped a bookmark into her book and went to the bathroom to brush her teeth, she found a nude. She found a note tacked tack to the sink. Dear Noodle, I once promised you a lifetime supply of chocolate, and Willie Wonka always keeps his word. In your house, you got hot and cold wire, of course, but I changed it. You have, no you have now have hot and chocolate. My chocolate. She twisted the tap and gasped it. Brits melted chocolate, gushed out of it. Whenever you drink it, I hope you think of me. I know I'll be thinking of you, your friend, Willie Wonka. P.S. If you ever need to get in touch, simply ask the little orange man with the green hair. Little orange man with the green hair, she said with a tuck, and then she spotted something on the floor. She crouched down his hand, her hands tracing the impossible outline of tiny footprints, she cried. Quickly, she followed them back into her bedroom, around the drawers, along the bookcase, under the bed, and all the way to the window, where a very small man was standing on the ledge. An orange man with green hair, she stood frozen in shock before giving a small, shy wave. He offered her a slight nod and form her acknowledgement in return. She couldn't believe it. He was real all along. Then, he, then quite suddenly, he burst to life, pulling strings at his side. There was a great clunk, and mechanical winds unfurled from his jacket. And he jumped right out of the window. Noodle rushed over and watched with utter joy as the Oompa Loompa dipped low, skimming the cobbles and swooped and soared off into the night. He flew up high past the silver of a factory and he gl glided over it. The sign on the roof burst to life and lights. Just one more more delicious than moonlight. Wonka. And that is the end of the story.